Hello, um, we would like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Especially, we would like to welcome our brand new seventh graders who are still sixth graders and their parents to tonight's curriculum presentation. I'm Kathy Peters and I'm head of the junior high school and I'm also the academic advisor for seventh and eighth grade. And I'm Carrie Ramos and I'm the director of counseling and student life at the upper school. And in our spare time, we do tag team comedy, so hopefully we'll entertain you tonight as well. <laughs> Not She's really. funnier than I am. Yeah. So if you currently have a sixth grader, we had some handouts outside just for you to take a look at, just to get, give you a little flavor of who we are and what we do. Uh, we gave you our academic support handout because we wanted you to see how we handle students who might need a little extra assistance. So we have office hours for all of our teachers. We also gave you what we call the postcard, which gives you all of the important dates for the year. If you're currently a seventh grade parent, you've already seen that a lot because we give it away on every occasion. And then we gave you some new little thing we called our yell card, which just gives some important things about Holy Trinity. The other handouts that you have, there's a typical seventh grade schedule. There is the calendar for the next school year. We do something called flex calendar, which means that we change weeks. We have A week, B week, C week, and we will talk more about why we do that. We just kind of want you to get to know that just a little bit. So those are just for you informationally. Eighth grade parents, we think we've given you, and the current parents going into eighth grade, we've given you enough paper for now, so we're just gonna talk to you tonight. So moving on in this journey, um, we already introduced ourselves, but as you move into later stages of advising, you're going to meet some of the other people in this office. I'm gonna let Carrie introduce and tell you a little bit about them. Sure, um, we have, um, Ms. Uh, Allison Bell, who is our Director of Strategic Initiatives, and she also um, does some college advising, so she is still part of our um, counseling staff and advising staff. Um, Mrs. Jo Pagan is the Director of College Counseling, and she works um, with students and families um, in 10th, 11th, and 12th grades um, through their college counseling um, journey. It's called a journey. And um, this is Melissa Uzier, who is also a college adv advisor in our office, and this is Bev McHenry, um, who is a ninth grade advisor. So lots of support and um, knowledgeable um, people in our office, and uh, we're very excited to uh, be working with um, our school family. So if you would like to take a picture tonight of any of the slides that we show, please feel free to do that. We're going to give you a lot of information. There will not be a test on this later. <laughs> and a lot of this information you're going to hear repeatedly because we know that just like children, you absorb what you need at the time. So I know that my students who are getting ready to leave seventh grade and going to eighth grade, you're really going to be very comfortable with a lot of the things that we're going to say. And if you're just coming here as a sixth grade parent, a lot of this is going to be new. I do want to do a little plug for two of our favorite books. We firmly believe that every parent should read this book. Sure. Um, How to Raise an Adult uh, by Julie Laycott Holmes is um, an amazing guide. It's a how-to. Um, very. She is the former dean at Stanford University, and um, she will give you lots of practical um, uh, advice on um, raising an adult. It is a little bit difficult to get started because it's a little painful for us to acknowledge some of the things that we may have um, made, some of the mistakes that we may have made um, on our journey as parents, and I am a parent. Um, and so, however, um, stick with it because it does get better. And um, there are just wonderful um, checklists in there, um, things that you should, you know, your, your teenager should be able to do the following things by the time they're 18 um, in order to be a successful adult. And it talks about self-efficacy and the idea that, you know, in order to be a successful adult, we should, the belief that we need to be able to believe that we are capable of doing um, whatever we set our minds to. And that is such a powerful yet difficult um, uh, principle to uh, achieve. And in this book, it really does help us as parents to lay the foundation and to guide our adolescents um, through that process. And um, there really isn't a better how-to guide in terms of parenting your child through that difficult process. Um, and I really, really encourage you to read it. 
before, if you, if you, if I didn't do a good enough um, commercial for it, uh, she allow her to please. There is, um, she's done a YouTube um, video for it. It's a 30-minute YouTube uh, commercial, or, or actually, it's, it's not a YouTube. It's a TED Talk. Sorry, 30-minute TED Talk, um, which will give you just enough, um, I think, for you to get hooked and really want to read the book. So please look it up. It's How to Raise an Adult, and you can Google How to Raise an Adult TED Talk. Um, and I promise you, um, you will be inspired um, to change and add some of um, uh, some some things into your parenting that um, that I think your teenagers will appreciate. They may not um, love at first, but they will appreciate in the long run. And you, as a parent, will know that you're raising successful adults, which is all of our goals, right? It was interesting for me to read it because I have adult children and looking at my first son who went to college and really struggled in that first year, had I known or thought about some of the things that she said, he would have fared much better. You know, we focus so much on academic achievement, but we can't focus on, on that solely and at the risk of so many other things. So she talks a lot about those things, which are important for us all to remember. The other, the other book I would recommend, actually Chaplain Jared brought this book to us, it's called iGen. And it's especially for me, who is not, I'm, I'm an old person, in case you couldn't tell, who is not brought up in this generation of screens, screens, and screens. It really talks about how that's reshaping education, our culture, and other things. I would strongly recommend this one as well. So our goals for our junior high students, clearly we have academic goals, but we want our junior high students to, and Carrie already used the words for you, to be students who have self we want them to strive for balance in their academic and personal life. We want them to pursue and develop areas of passion. Nothing makes me happier than watching a junior high student get excited about lacrosse or realize that they really do love their flute and they're gonna continue playing the flute. So this is a time when passions really bud and start to develop. Sometimes in that process, we try four or five things. We might be ready to throw up your hands, but that's what junior high school is about, trying out new things and figuring out what we really love. We also want them to develop academic, moral, social, and emotional awareness. A lot's going on in the junior high school. Um, in the brain, in the social avenue, our friends become so important to us, so we want them to understand how all of those things have to interplay and work together. We also want them to be able to be to advocate for themselves, to become responsible people, to be self-directed, and to be motivated from within. None of us are planning, I hope, to go to college with our children, so they have to learn how to go after the things that they want for themselves, to use their resources and to get those things. It might be fun to go back to college. For sure. I know. <laughs> Not with my child. So seventh graders in general very much want to do the right thing. Thus, we have seventh graders who walk down our halls carrying every single thing that they own on their back. We call this the turtle effect, okay? We do give them lockers, but no seventh graders like to use them because everything must go with me at all times, therefore I am always prepared. It's very stressful at the beginning of the year because they have seven teachers that they need to please and trying to sort all that out. It's a big change from elementary school. Seventh graders can also be very easily overwhelmed for the reason that I just mentioned. So much, the day here is very fluid and things are moving all of the time. And if you are a person like me who needs time to process or needs a few minutes to sit and think about things, it's hard to find that in the school day. Seventh graders work very hard to meet expectations. Your expectations, their friends' expectations, their teachers' expectations, and their own expectations. That's a very big plate for some very small people. Trying to balance all of that is difficult as well. They try on new interests and personas. I love talking with them because their interests change more frequently than Florida's weather, and they're always thinking about the new things. So it's really interesting to see what the crazes and the fads are that they're interested in. Their friends become very, very important to them, and that creates a very interesting dynamic at school when someone's upset with someone, Clearly that would not be a good time to take a math test, but unfortunately math tests happen, whether we're upset with our friends or not. And that plays into many, many things. What's different about eighth graders? And you will start to see this. In fact, some of you sitting out there who have a person that's going into eighth grade, you may be seeing some of these things already because I am. Um, they, the biggest change for them 
because many of them will be taking their first high school credit class, which will send you into a panic because you are now thinking about their high school transcript. Some of them are going to be taking more than one high school credit class, so then we get nervous about the grade, which makes them nervous about the grade. In seventh grade, we're like, oh, it's just junior high, it's not that important. And we're like, oh, high school credit. So that, that's stressful for them. Those classes uh, count a bit more, the exams are a bit more difficult, the teacher's expectations are a bit higher. We give them in eighth grade a lot more responsibility. We mother our seventh graders. We follow along behind them, remind, remind them to do things. Second semester for our eighth graders, we're stepping back because we need them to be responsible and self-directed as they go into high school. Their friendships and interests shift and change. We both spend a lot of time with girls in the eighth grade who are trying to figure out who their friendship group is now. It's a bit easier for boys, but girls really struggle with that. They may have gone to school with somebody since pre-K three, and all of a sudden this person and I have such different interests, but we've been friends for such a long time, so are we not gonna be friends, or what are we gonna do about that? It's a struggle, and we really see that second semester for eighth grade. They push boundaries, and they start to experiment a little bit, which translates into sometimes getting into trouble, okay? Which I'm sure terrifies you, but you would much rather that your junior high student get in trouble when the consequences are smaller and don't involve discipline that we have to report to colleges because we want them to learn. We want them to make mistakes and learn. And that is very, very important. So when I'm working with them on things like that, what choice did you make? How did that turn out? What were the consequences? What would we change for the next time? Because we want to learn what we're going to do differently. They do have an increased interest in the opposite sex, so that's an interesting thing to see that come alive. So people that were very comfortable with each other all the way through sixth or seventh grade, now it's like, hmm, okay, not quite sure how I'm gonna navigate this relationship as well. Mood shifts are very, very common, and I'm sure you will see this as well. I can have someone come into my office at 7.30 in the morning, and they're extremely upset, and I will go through and get all calmed down, and I'll go check to them at 11 o'clock, and they'll look at me like, what, why are you bothering me? they're fine because things just change so quickly. So, you want to add anything to that? Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> so, um, to help you navigate through this world of what classes to take when and all of those things, we publish a curriculum guide. We update it every year. We've been working on it since probably almost since school started. What classes are we going to offer? This has all of our policies, our graduation requirements, and a description of all of the classes that we offer. Also, how the classes are sequenced, what you have to take before what, what goes after what, what you have to take with. And that is available online as well as a print publication. And isn't the cover beautiful? So reflective and inspirational. So, I love it. You want to talk for a little bit? Sure. This is a, a list, and it's actually on one of the first pages. But this is our guide. These are our graduation requirements, and these are the minimum requirements that a student must um, achieve or earn in order to earn a high school Holy Trinity high school diploma. Um, and so, in each of the core subject areas, math and English, they have to earn at least four credits. Um, in math, um, as Mrs. Peter said, many of the students will start in junior high. Um, specifically, eighth grade is um, common for them to start. And so they will earn a math credit in eighth grade, many of them will. And so, so it's not uncommon for our students to have more than four credits um, of math um, while they're, during their time at Holy Trinity and so um, on their transcript. But this is the minimum, so four credits in math. Um, English, four credits, and all of those English credits will come while they're in high school, so that's good news. Um, science um, and social science, this one is um, sort of a joint one here. Um, the students will need to do um, three or four, um, so a total of seven between the two subject areas. Um, so if they choose um, three science credits, then they do four social science credits and vice versa. I will tell you that many of our students earn probably 10 credits between science and social science, but this is one area where they have flexibility. Um, and in the high school, uh, we have amazing departments um, that are you know, beyond um, in the arts and in the journalism and mass media, and students um, really want to take time and to pursue those um, passion and interests, and it's difficult to do that if we restrict them academically um, with graduation requirements. So this is one thing that we, one way that we are um, able to give them the flexibility um, to pursue those passion and interests in a seven period day um, each year. Uh, by giving them some flexibility here. So um, of the science credits, 
um, they do have to take biology um, and uh, chemistry or physics and an elective. Um, we do carefully advise students and families depending on their um, long-term goals in terms of college and um, career interests ultimately um, in terms of the chemistry or physics. Um, I will say the vast majority of our graduates do take biology, chemistry, physics, and a science elective, like I said. Um, it's very important in terms of college preparatory um, curriculum. However, it's not necessarily needed for all um, colleges and for all majors. So it's, it's, it's just one way to individualize um, your child's curriculum here. In terms of social science, we do dictate what um, three of the, or what, uh, what those credits need to be. Um, and we're gonna actually go into that further when we go into the department and we'll tell you what those need to be. Um, all students need to take three credits in language. Um, two of them have to be consecutive. And um, we do offer Latin, Spanish, and French. And like Mrs. Peter said, this is one area where many students do start in junior high to earn that first credit, sometimes two. <clears throat> all students do need to take one credit of fine arts. And this one is um, one, they need to earn one credit of fine arts while in high school. So um, we'll talk about seventh and eighth grade curriculum, but just know that further ahead, they will need to take one fine art class while in high school. Um, in terms of eighth grade, I know you're gonna talk about HOPE, um, so I'll leave that, but just know that their HOPE class does count towards graduation and is reflected in that um, physical education or health with physical education variation. That's that, that's HOPE, <laughs> and it's on there in terms of the graduation list. And students in high school will all be expected to take one half of a credit or one semester of religion by the time they graduate. So I know that's kind of the next step, but since many of you are in this room, um, have children or students are going into um, eighth grade and are starting to take high school classes, you need to know that those high school classes, um, many of them are starting to count towards graduation. In addition, and you certainly don't need to worry about this now, but especially for students going into eighth grade, another uh, one additional graduation requirement that we have is 100 hours of community service or service learning. I bring this up now because with our junior high students, what you really want to start doing is doing some family experiences with service learning. You can get involved in Habit for Humanity, you can go to the Humane, Humane Society and volunteer with your family for a day, you can get involved in things with the whole family of doing service to the community. Many of you have churches where your children can get involved. Um, there's Vacation Bible School over the summer, so it doesn't out, but what you can do is get them to start getting out there and finding out what they enjoy doing and what they don't enjoy doing. My son found out that he really enjoyed working with younger children when he was doing his community service. He wouldn't have known that. So if you are a parent of a current seventh grader, they can start earning community service hours for graduation credit in the summer after eighth grade is over. So if you want to do something this summer, get out and start practicing a little bit. When we do community service, and when we're thinking about that, what you want to show a college is that you have something that you're passionate and excited about. So it's better to get something, wow, I really love coaching soccer. I really love working with animals at the Brevard Zoo. I'm really excited about working at Harmony Farms with horses and do a lot of hours. 100 hours is the minimum. Most of our students go far above and beyond that because they find something that they're very excited about. And from a counseling perspective, um, one way that I usually talk with um, students and families when um, in times of high stress or in drama, when there's drama in the friend group um, or when you're feeling especially isolated or I don't know, just in, in difficult times, um, service to others um, can be a very therapeutic thing. Um, and it does two things. It helps others, of course, um, but it also helps to lift you and it helps you to, to um, get kind of outside of your own little, um, whatever you're struggling with. And so from a counseling perspective, I think that if you can help as a parent um, and a family, make service part of your, um, uh, part of your mantra, part of your family, like this is who we are, and this is, I think that that can help create, um, foster a sense of um, healthy um, relationships and healthy uh, just family life, and that would help um, Help, help your teenagers as they grow and develop, but it also helps them with their own personal development and kind of helps in times of drama. 
so I agree. Just because there are a few people who procrastinate, so we don't have someone who's a senior and says, oh, I've only done one community service hour. We help them by structuring it. They have to do 12 and a half hours per semester, and there's a date that it's due that they have to turn it in once they're in high school. So that kind of helps manage it a bit. And as I said, they can go over and beyond it, but we make sure that they're meeting those minimum benchmarks as we go along. This is also important for, for future scholarships and things like that, which you definitely don't want to hear about right now, but just so you know. So here's our grading scale. Um, just so you can see it, notice that um, our top grade is an A, and you can see what band that covers. Just so you can see it. We won't talk about AP classes or honors classes right now. <laughs> Actually, I think you do. Yep, there it is. <laughs> Never mind. So when we talk about waiting for a particular class, because we know that there a lot more effort goes into making an A in a particular class, we do what's called waiting a particular class. So if you're taking an honors class, we wait that class. So an A in that class would have an extra 0.5. If you're taking an, a, an AP class, an A in that class would give you a 1.0 in additional. But I will say that in this audience, we have rising seventh and rising eighth. And um, the College Board is the governing organization that puts out the AP curriculum, which that's eight advanced placement classes. And those are classes where you earn college credit while in high school. And the only thing I'm gonna say about that is that they're not allowed as seventh and eighth graders, not by us, although we wouldn't probably want that anyway, um, but College Board does not allow seventh and eighth graders to take AP classes. So we don't need to worry about that yet. Um, but in terms of weighting, um, the, the grading scale, yes, the honors would be relevant for sure. Last question. Can I just yeah. ask a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. The grading scale. Yes. I imagine at other high schools, that's not their grading scale, correct? Correct. So, and I'm cool with it, don't get yep. me wrong. But do you not feel this puts some of the students at a disadvantage? Because if you have a, a kid who's scoring 91s all the time, but he's still getting an A, mm -hmm. but when it comes to the GPA and applying for colleges, do you not think that might affect him negatively? Excellent question. Um, the question was, does our grading scale, when compared to other high schools, um, you know, uh, reflect, put, put our students at a disadvantage when applying to colleges? So comparing our students with others who are applying. Um, and it's a wonderful question, and the answer is no. Um, we send um, every single application uh, that goes out um, is, is uh, accompanied with, um, by a uh, school profile. So that school profile um, does have our GPA scale. Um, it also has tons of information, including things like our AP enrollment philosophy. They, they, as colleges have a really good understanding of our school and the curriculum that we offer, the rigor, how well our students do, um, you know, the, the um, uh, how well, how, you know, how strong the classes are and, and things like that. They understand that students who are applying from Holy Trinity are applying within this sort of bubble and are being judged accordingly. Um, and so they do not necessarily know, they know that they're not comparing apples to apples. Okay. I would just, I would just add to that, that one other thing that we know is that when a college looks at a particular student, a college is going to calculate whatever GPA they want to calculate. They're going to pull out certain grades and classes and look at them. So they're doing their own analysis anyway, which they would do for any student from any high school. And yeah, I the, imagine it's a bigger picture. I just oh, thought yeah. that's yeah. a small Absolutely. piece of it. Absolutely. That's, that's a, a wonderful good question. question. A great question. I could talk probably for a while about this, but I will tell you, I learned something the other night. We had an Ask the Ask Expert panel, and um, we had uh, Georgia Tech Director of Admissions, um, UF Director of Admissions, um, and um, Colleges That Change Lives um, person here. And I learned that there are so many different uh, grading scales out there that one school even has a 13.0. And they were like, imagine trying to compare that to this. So it really is, they understand, and it's, you know, it is, it is a challenge for them. Um, but that's something that we, publish um, our school profile so that they can better understand our students. They also look at Holy Trinity students. You know, many schools will read Holy Trinity applications together so that they understand and, you know, are, are looking at them together. So we're just going to touch briefly on AP or advanced placement classes because we know that being the educated parents you are, you are reading information about how many AP classes my student must take or they will never get into this college or the other college. And 
None of that is what we need to worry about at this time, but this is our philosophy regarding AP classes, so I'm just going to let you read that. I think the most important thing I would want to stay, say here is that the very most important thing you can do is work with your student's advisor continuously from 7th grade through 12th grade to talk about where passions lie, where interests lie, because if you are not excited about history, you do not want to be taking AP World History. You want to be taking a class where you're going to be spending a lot of time and a lot of energy in something that you're passionate about. And when we get into upper high school, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, we can see that, and that is the best way to get those AP experiences. So every year in our curriculum guide, we have new classes. We have dynamic, excited teachers who are always changing what they want to teach or coming up with great ideas. And we are able to, because we are the size we are, because we're, we are a private school, we're able to say, that sounds like a great idea. Let's see if people would like to take that. So these are our new classes. For, and these are mostly high school classes. But I just wanted you to see some of the exciting and new things that we're going to be offering that your students can look forward to. Two areas that we're really focusing on this year for both junior high and high school are our science and technology department and also our physical education program. As many of you may know, we have a new facility coming online, so we're really looking at how our PE program, our athletic program, can make good use of that facility and also how we can take our junior high and high school program and really change PE to make it be more specific for the students' personal and lifelong fitness as well as enhance our, so we have so many athletes help them to enhance their athletic performance. So we also have some new junior high, school, high courses. Um, Mrs. Bust, who is head of the senior high, and, our, and I are very excited that we are offering science research this year. This year we did not have a science research class, but uh, she and I got to help the science research students prepare to go to science fair, and we must have done okay because we had four <laughs> students compete, and they all came in first place. Um, two of them got best in show, and they had bids for state. So here's Mrs. Bus right over here, so we can give us a hand for doing that. So we're really excited. Very excited. That was a seventh grader, an eighth grader, a ninth grader, and eleventh grader, or ten, and then eleventh grader. So seventh, eighth, ninth, and eleventh. So we are very excited to have that class come back for us. We offer it from year to year, but we're, that, that's next year for junior high. So a seventh arising, except from, someone coming into seventh grade or eighth grade could certainly take science research to do a project. We, as I said, we're working on our engineering technology program, so we have two new classes next year coming along, which I'm very excited about. The first one is called Introduction to Design, Engineering, and Programming. That's just for seventh graders, and it's just that first, let me put my toes into what computer design looks like, what engineering looks like, what design looks like. That could be applied in a lot of different places, so that's like an engineering programming design class. And for eighth graders, we're going to go more in depth into the world of robotics, which is used in so many different places. So for someone going into eighth grade next year, that's going to be a year-long class. And again, not just trying to focus on how these two disciplines, engineering and robotics, can be applied in many different places. So I'm excited about both of those. And then we're offering a class for eighth and ninth graders. Its nickname is PhysEng. And its long name is the Physical Science of Engineering. This is going to be a class that's really looking at the different places that physics and engineering come together. Biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, industrial engineering. How, do all of, how does physics work in that? How do those disciplines work together? So I think that's going to be a really exciting class as well. If you're going into eighth grade, that requires that you have completed Algebra 1 honors already. Okay. So that's who would be eligible to take that class. Question. No, it's going to be, it's a redesign, a totally redesign class. So you'll hear, you already heard us talking about AP, and Carrie reminded me that a lot of you didn't even know what AP meant, so thank you for that. <laughs> so, well, I think they know. But, but yeah, well, it, was, it would just be nice to explain it. So our classes are offered at different levels, and you hear, you'll hear us talk about that. In the junior high level, classes are offered at either the advanced level or the standard or regular level. For our seventh graders coming in, with the exception of math, all of their classes are offered at the advanced level. Our seventh graders come to us from all over Brevard County, so we put them in. Their classes are very, very similar, except for math, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. 
that are eighth graders because we know them well and we can place them more appropriately. Their classes are divided English, history, and science into advanced or regular. You see that same thing reflected in high school. In high school, the classes are offered at the college prep level, the honors level, and the advanced placement level. All of those classes are a rigor enough, rigorous enough program that a student would certainly be accepted into college. We just like to place our students where they need to be placed. You'll see students who take advanced eighth grade history and English, but they take standard level algebra and physical science. It just depends on their needs and who they are as people. So the eighth grade core classes, there are four of them. As I just said, they're offered at the advanced and the regular level, and placement is based on teacher recommendations. And once again, the best way to discuss that is for us to sit down and talk about what we think is best and what's gonna work. I have all the recommendations from the teachers, but eighth graders take eighth grade English, eighth grade US history. Most of them are in algebra one, geometry, or algebra two, and again, honors or regular, and then physical science. When we talk about a class that's a high school credit class, that's always going to be the honor level. So I would say eighth grade advanced English, but algebra one honors, because those high school credit classes, they switch to that designation. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, eighth graders also take the following. All of them take HOPE and PE. Um, HOPE is Health Opportunities Through Physical Education. And as Carrie mentioned earlier, that is a high school uh, credit, graduation credit. We are working on that class next year. I'm really excited about what we're doing in the PE program. Our PE teachers are gonna be working together and dividing up the students. So one day they might have one PE teacher, they might work, be working on stretching and strength. Some of them might be having a lecture about nutrition. Some of them might be having a guest speaker come in. Some of them might be outside doing a sport or particular thing. So it's a, a really good redesign. So I think it's gonna be a great class for the eighth graders. Because of that, we, we vary how we offer the HOPE curriculum, but next year HOPE will run through the whole entire year. The other thing that I'm excited about is some of those topics are appropriate for seventh graders, so seventh graders will also be part of some of that curriculum as well. The other thing that we're gonna add into it, we already do character education with our seventh and eighth graders, so that's gonna become a, a pretty standard part of the PE curriculum, as well as being able to work on some study skills with our coaches during that time, so we're excited about that. Then, so there's your five core classes. Then eighth graders take two electives. We like them to take a fine art elective and an academic elective because that's a more balanced program. Some of them take two fine arts because that's where their passions lie. And with a discussion with their advisor, we can talk about taking two academic electives as well. So many eighth graders will start their foreign language if they haven't already. I will say one thing about the HOPE class. Um, this is this does count um, towards the state of Florida's um, requirement for um, HOPE, it, and we we just put it in junior high um, because we can. <laughs> um, we we do believe that it's more appropriate. Um, the topics that are covered really we believe should be covered in junior high. Um, they are. Um, uh, definitely needing to um, to be covered at uh, it's more developmentally appropriate and we have the flexibility to be able to do that um, at our school so that's why we do um, but it does meet the requirement for the state of Florida um, in terms of public school and things like that so if you hear it um, out there um, it is the hope class that the state of Florida teaches in high school um, or they make you take it online and uh, seventh graders. As I mentioned, all of our classes with the exception for math are the same for seventh graders. So our seventh graders all take uh, advanced English, they take advanced life science, advanced world geography. There's no advanced PE. So I definitely wouldn't have been in that. They all take PE. <laughs> and then we place them in math. So just to give you a little sampling for that, I have seventh graders are in, who are in pre-algebra. This year pre-algebra advanced, algebra one honors, and that is based, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, on their placement test results, their teacher recommendations, and other information that you bring to us when they come. One more silly question. So if my daughter completes pre-algebra advanced in seventh grade, does she go to algebra one? Next slide. Uh, maybe. I'll, I'll right. Maybe. My bad. <laughs> Okay. I'm just yes. saying, yes. if she, she does the, the, the pre-algebra advanced, coming. does she have to do algebra one as well before she goes to algebra two? Yes. Okay. yes, we're, we're going to show you that right yep. now. Okay. You are ahead. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're ready to go. So, 
In addition to those five core classes, just like eighth graders, our seventh graders also choose two electives. I really like to be careful about selecting electives for them because coming to junior high is such a big bite. So if a seventh grader tells me, I want to take acting and choir, I'm totally good with that because I know those are going to be fun, relaxing, stress-reducing classes. If a seventh grader comes to me and says, I want to take Latin and science research, that's going to be a conversation. Okay? Some people might be ready to take Latin and science research, but that's a conversation that we'll have as a family to see. What else are you doing outside? Well, I'm playing three sports and I play the cello. Okay, that's going to be a pretty heavy program for you. So that's an individual decision, and, and, that, and that's how we do it from the, all the way through. Definitely placement in foreign language. I really like to take a look at their language arts test scores and their grades in language arts and to see what their teachers have to say. Because if you just think about it logically, if I'm still struggling working on my English grammar, I certainly don't want to be trying to learn Spanish grammar. Because remember, a foreign language is a high school credit class, so we're not just doing our colors and numbers and singing songs, we're learning how to conjugate verbs. You know, they do the preterite, they do the past, the, so it, it's, it's tough. So they, they have to be ready for that. It has homework, too, like this. You have to think about the homework so for fine arts for junior high, this would be both seventh and eighth grade. Here are their fine arts electives that they can choose from. These classes are all offered, per percussion, band, choir, orchestra, are all offered at different levels. So you could come in and next year we will have a real beginning band. So if your child says, Mom, I always wanted to play the tuba, this is your chance to bring the tuba home with you because we, we're going to start band with people who have never <laughs> <laughs> right back there. <laughs> so, um, a real beginning band. Never played an instrument, know nothing about music, but think I want to do that. We have the same thing with the orchestra. Never played a violin, but I think I want to do that same thing. Um, question? Great question. Her question was, if they're in seventh grade, how do they do the band thing? So our band, choir, and orchestra teachers make recommendations for us, and they tell us. So our levels of band, for example, are beginning band, concert band, symphonic band, and then the different ensembles. So Mr. McCarl will give us a list of this person needs to go here, there. So we'll know that when we do the advising plan. So it's not necessarily based on grade level. I have a seventh grader this year who's in the wind ensemble because he's been playing for such a long time. Did that answer? I just wanted you all to know that we, you know, we lots of times they'll ask if your student is going to join the band, the choir, the orchestra, or percussion, they'll ask them to come in and play for them, and then that gives them a better idea of where they want to place them. So for academic electives, as we mentioned, they can start their foreign language. We offer Spanish, French, and Latin, and there are reasons for taking any of the three languages, which I'm happy to discuss with you in a family conversation. We offer quiet study. So back to my person who was playing three sports and the cello, that person might want to put a quiet study in their schedule. Quiet study is simply a class period. We have a teacher that's there to monitor. Students come in and they have 47 minutes to work on whatever it is that they need to work on. They can be working on homework, they can be studying for a test. Our academic coaches can pull them for a few minutes and work with them on something in math, something in organization or reading. So if you already know that your child is very busy on the outside, that's a good alternative for them. It just gives them a little bit of space. Or if you know that this is going to be a big jump for your child, that's another great thing to offer. So quiet study. Then we have a class called Math Logic. Math Logic is for students who enjoy math and the challenging problem solving side of math. They uh, compete in math competitions. That's our goal to have them do the math counts competitions. And also just think about other ways that we can apply and use mathematics in life. So it's a very fun class for people who like math. <laughs> that would not be me, but okay. I already talked a little bit about um, design, programming, and engineering, and robotics, and then science research. So those are the academic sides of the electives. So always when we start talking about high school credit classes, people get really nervous. Okay, my child's in seventh grade and he's taking algebra, he's taking Latin. What is that going to do to that all-important high school transcript? So a grade earned in a high school credit class in the junior high will appear on the transcript. However, the grade is not calculated into the high school GPA. 
So the GPA clock starts running in the ninth grade, okay? Colleges will see those grades, but they are really focusing on the nine through 12 grades. Do you want to comment on that? Or yes. Mm -hmm. They also do, as you pointed out earlier, sometimes and will um, pull their own, you know, they will run their own calculation. And so they, they will definitely some, and we, every college is different. So I can't tell you that there's a magic um, formula that all colleges use, I wish I could. Uh, but they, they might be interested in that algebra one grade. Um, but in general, um, the, you know, grades you earn in, you know, the uh, later years of high school are certainly closer to, uh, um, in terms of more predictable, in terms of how you would be um, uh, performing in college, right? So, um, not as much in eighth grade. Okay, so now, here you go. <laughs> so, for in our curriculum guide, and for all of our disciplines, we have what we call a flow chart, which kind of helps you to plan a little bit. I was meeting with a student of mine who's going into the ninth grade. She, so we have, a, some of you have them, we have this, we call it the four year plan, it's really the five or six year plan. And she came in and she had her plan already filled out. She had all of her courses filled out for high school. And I was like, well, okay, my work here is done. And so <laughs> some people are gonna wanna think that far ahead. Um, your child may only wanna think about the current year and that may be best for your family, but it's great to look at these because you can kind of be thinking about where you're going. So if you look at yourself as a seventh grader, most seventh graders, as I said, are in pre-algebra or pre-algebra advanced. And notice on the math electives, imagine that, electives and math, who knew? So we have math logic for junior high as an elective class. So a seventh grader could take pre-algebra advanced and math logic. An eighth grader could take algebra one honors and math logic if they wanted a math elective as well. So you can see where we end up. And then if you look at the honors and AP um, list, a person who makes it all the way to multivariable calculus is really doing a third year of college calculus. That's a lot of math. The other thing I want you to notice when you, we get to Algebra 2 honors, notice the little arrows, arrows. That's teacher recommendation. The teacher is working with the student and telling them, here's where I think you would best be served. And the student and the family has some input as well. Depending on what you think you want to study and what your interests are, you might say, I want to slow this down a little bit. I'm going to take pre-calc honors and then I'm going to take honors calculus because there are some other things I want to take. Or if you're like, I am going to be an engineer and I love math and I want to do this, you might want to go that far in math. I know we have the flow charts for the rest of the um, departments and I know you wanted to talk about this one um, as in particular. So our tech classes, our technology classes are that's the area where we're really working on and changing things. Um, this is where computer and engineering classes are going to be. So the area that we're focusing on for this particular year is the revamp in our engineering and robotics. So you can see the progression. There's the seventh grade class at the top going to the eighth grade class. And then we have three new classes for the high school level. You'll see them better explained in the curriculum guide, but those are high school level classes. And then for a very strong eighth grader who is going into ninth grade, that's where we'd be looking at those two AP electives, but those are really high school classes as well. You can see the science classes that we talked about on the other side. So there's social studies, world languages. Notice you can see the three year progression. Our languages go all the way to the AP level as well. This is, we don't even touch on this in junior high because the first time you could really get into this is in high school. This is our broadcast, our yearbook, our, um, you already went to art. I did. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's good. So you can see the two junior high classes at the top and where we could go with high school. And I think you can see that's where passions develop. Somebody who is really interested in art, they could take that all the way to AP Studio or art, art and Design. Here's your performing arts. We already talked about the profession there from the very beginning, moving all the way through. We do have special diplomas. We talked a little bit about AP already. Again, this is not something that we want to dwell on tonight or talk about too much, but those are the diplomas, the AP capstone diploma. You'll hear about that if you're out in the parent community. And we have two diploma specializations, Holy Trinity as well, which is our STEAM and Global Citizenship Diploma. So how do we choose those classes? So for our current seventh grade, our retreat day is next Thursday, February 27th. We'll be spending the whole day with the seventh graders. They will, current seventh graders, they'll be with me for a session. I will give them this information and information that's specific to them. They will actually be in on campus selecting the courses that they want to take. 
and then they requ their requests are due March the 5th, so you have that much time to think about it. After March 5th, the requests are closed. They can't go in and make requests, so if they decide to change something, um, they need to come in and talk to me about it. Advising continues, like if you're like, oh no, I haven't made an appointment, I have to get to see you before March 5th. No, the requests are just closed to them, and the reason that we do that is because we're opening it up for another grade level to go in and make requests. We can make cor course requests all the way through the end of the year. And Please then, don't think you have to meet with Mrs. Peters by March 5th, because she can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> she can't possibly meet with everybody <laughs> by March 5th. So, so don't worry if you haven't made an appointment already. And our current sixth grade, we'll have another information day, and I know you're aware of that because we sent it to you on April 25th, which is the day of the math placement test. And at that time, um, your request is going to do May 4th, but again, I really like to do my sixth going into seventh grade appointments in the month of May because I'm done with my others at that time, so we can definitely sit down and talk about course requests then. And you're probably wondering, how are you going to do that? So when you come for the math placement test, since you don't have accounts or anything, you'll come and hear the information. If you don't come because you already came tonight, we send you a link to a Google Doc if you are currently in sixth grade, and then you pick your electives and send them to me, and then I put them in for you. And then for the math placement, when you take the math placement test, um, we will, our head of the math department scores them, evaluates them, we take a look at them with all of that data, and then you get a letter telling you what your math placement is. So I really can build a schedule for a seventh grader because the core courses are the same, and I just put in the math placement, and then you tell me the two electives. So this is what, whoops. <laughs> so this is what it looks like for current seventh graders. This is their on campus. So they go in and you can see course requests. I show them how to do this. They can show it to you. You can't make course requests for them. So sorry, they have to do their own course requests, but you can see them when they're doing it. So that'll be the 27th, you'll be able to look and talk to them. I would definitely talk to them beforehand. What are you thinking about or, you know, for electives or things like that. Because some of you don't know us at all, I just wanted to talk for a minute about the support that we offer to our students. I'm going to let you do that if you want to. Just real quick. Sure. Um, we have a very um, open um, and we uh, campus in terms of our teachers want the students to come in and ask for help. Um, and so we, our teachers post office hours. They um, at the, you know, we have cards that have the office hours published that we hand out to students when they need support, um, and we hand it out to families. And we really want students to take advantage of that. So if you are struggling or have a question, um, please, the first place is to, um, is to ask your teacher. They're the ones um, who, you are, you know, who are presenting the lesson. They're the ones who are putting together um, the quizzes and the tests and the, and the um, projects. And they are the they are the expert in that course, and so it is the most important first stop would be to the teacher. And so we do want you to utilize the office hours. The teachers want you to come in, um, and so we we hope that you will use um, the office hours that we um, that the teachers provide. In addition to that, um, we do uh, staff a math lab in the upper school, um, and this is um, free of charge. It is a you know, first, it's the second line, right? Or in addition to the teacher support. And um, this is staffed by the math department. There's also, because it's so popular um, at times, it all, there are also um, New Alpha Theta, which is our honor society, our math honor society, um, students there who are tutoring um, other students in math. And um, so this is constantly, you know, uh, very, you know, very much used and uh, lots of great stuff is happening there. So just know that that's, on, that's available as well. Um, and it's alive and, and running and uh, is a wonderful support to our students. And it's amazing um, that our school administration supports that for you and for your students. Um, academic coaching, Mrs. Peters talked about it earlier or referred to it earlier, um, and we do have this available. It is um, really strong in the junior high. There's a huge presence and um, these women are amazing. They are little bumblebees, little buzzing bees in and out of classes, pulling students, helping them, providing support one-on-one -on -one in small groups, helping them, um, you know, clarify tests, and, you know, it's just amazing what they're able to do, um, and they help to support students and teachers day in and day out. So these are all things that are available to you and to your students um, and to really our faculty and staff, and um, I just want to make sure that you know about them um, and that you're encouraging your students to use them um, and, um, and, and just how amazing it is that, that, that it's available. When school starts next year, 
excuse me, you'll have it scheduled for the math lab. If I show you the postcard for office hours, you'll have one of those for next year. And the academic coaches are scheduled through the, through the, the coaches are scheduled through the academic advisor. So that would be me right now for seventh and eighth grade. Just let them know, hey, my child needs some help. We'll probably already know because we pretty much stay on top of it. So, so um, a lot of you worry about testing and when we start standardized testing, our seventh and eighth graders take achievement testing in the junior high school in both seventh and eighth grade. We use those results for placement and also for looking at strengths and weaknesses of our students. It helps us drive our curriculum and know what we need to work on with the students. In the high school, we do the PSAT for all students um, in 9th through 11th grades in October. It is part of the school day. Um, and, and then uh, also in the spring of the 10th grade year, we're actually going to do it on Friday with the 10th graders during the school day as well as part of their retreat day. They take a practice ACT. And then um, through the advising um, and its uh, family, uh, family appointments and advising, in general, we do recommend that students start uh, their testing, their ACT and SAT um, experience in the spring of their junior year, um, and that they take, um, in general, usually around three to five um, ACT or SAT tests um, throughout their high school career. We're moving a little quickly because we are reaching the end of our time here, but is that the last slide? Telling us we have to stop oh, talking. Taking over, Nick. Yeah. So, just so you are also aware, this summer um, we will have opportunities. If you want to brush up on your math skills, we offer a math lab. We'll have a summer brochure coming out talking about all of our summer offerings. But just be aware that if you want your child to work on math at any grade level, we do offer the math lab. And additionally, we offer what are called micro terms. That's also in our summer brochure. A lot of fun things that your child can do just for a week and get a quarter of their credit. I would really strongly encourage you, if your child is coming into seventh grade, to come to Junior High 101. The dates are up there. It's July 20th through 24th. It's such a great orientation to life in the junior high. They'll get their schedules, their lockers. They'll meet their teachers and a lot of people that they're, they will be involved with all year. But most importantly, they will meet the other seventh graders. So please put that on your calendar and make sure that you are able to do that. If you need, if that's from 9 to 12 for that week, but if you need an afternoon program, we offer them lunch, and then they can work on writing and keyboarding in the afternoon. So that makes a full day for those of you who need a full day type program for that week. Just some things for you to think about doing this summer as you're looking down the road. Visit a college campus. Make sure you do a great job on your summer reading when we get that information to you, and that'll be coming soon. Um, there are so many great resources available to us now. If you don't have a Khan Academy account, I strongly suggest that you get familiar with Khan Academy. They offer great math review programs. They have a phenomenal SAT test prep program. You'll hear more about that when your student gets into high school. But it's never too soon for you as parents to start looking around. I tell all of my students to start interviewing adults about what they do for their jobs, you know, and talk about where they went to college, just because so they can start picturing themselves moving forward in life with career and college. And we already talked a bit about getting involved in the community and doing community service. Very important as a family right now. That's a lot of information, and we know that. So I think the most important thing I want to say to you, well, I want to say two things. First of all, I want to thank you for coming and listening, and please make an appointment because these are things that we want to talk about individually. Then you can ask the questions which you can't really ask in a big group, and plus it will be more tailored to your child. And the other thing I would say is I think we have tried, and I hope we've done a good job of emphasizing the fact that we're here for you, and we want to be supportive and helpful for this entire, our entire journey. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We have another program that's going to start at 6.30, so I'm going to move out into the small chapel. So if you have questions that you want to ask me specifically, I'll be there for a few minutes. I do have to come back in at 6.30 because I get to talk to my eighth grade parents. But I look forward to getting to know you all, and thanks again for coming tonight. We would like to ask um, current seventh grade parents, or at least invite you. Um, Dr. Cobb is going to start the next presentation, and she has a short um, announcement or um, that she would, has invited you to stay for. So if you do want to stay for that, um, current seventh grade parents, um, it just involves um, the uh, upper school community. So um, if you want to stay for that, you're welcome to. It's going to start in about five minutes, um, and then you can um, leave.
Um, and Mrs. Peters is going to go to the small chapel um, for if you have a current sixth grader.